Are you guys ready for part two on cold calls? Stick around, we're gonna get you moving because this is Get You Moving Monday. Get ya, get ya, get ya. Get you moving Monday! I'm Ryan Coleman of the Broward and the Miami Dade Real Estate Investors Associations, also known as the Bria MC. Coming to you from the Bria and MD Ria headquarters. Well, hey guys, how's everybody doing? Welcome to Get You Moving Monday. Now, last week, we started a three-part series on cold calling. So we did part one. If you didn't get a chance to check out Get You Moving Monday last week, check the description below. There will be a link so you can go back and watch that video. Now, for today, part two of cold calling, we're gonna talk today about doing your preliminary research, getting your intro ready so that when you make, you know what, let's just go out to my friend the whiteboard and I'll explain it all to you out there. So when you're making your cold calls, when you're getting ready, you want to do a little bit of research on the property itself. Now I know that sometimes in cold call situations, if you just have a phone number and address, you might not be near the computer um, and you're going to be making these calls without any preliminary research. That's going to be a little bit tougher for you in the beginning. So what I suggest is to kind of create your cold calling situations where you're sitting down, you're at the home office, you got Reifax in front of you, have the information so that as you're having the conversation with the homeowner, if you need um, to, to, you know, to look anything up or get any more information while you're in the phone call, you're gonna be able to do that. So the environment that you wanna be in for your cold calls is a quiet environment where it's just you, the computer, no interruptions, so that way you can make your calls freely. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna do some preliminary research. Anytime I'm gonna be calling someone, because it's a cold call and you're gonna be surprising them a little bit, you don't wanna be the one that's surprised. So you wanna know some information about the property. So the basic information that we wanna know is who owns it? Who owns the property? So make sure that you're addressing the right person. If there's a husband and wife, obviously whoever picks up the phone, you can always assume it's Mr. or Mrs. Um, but just know who owns the property and you also wanna know what they bought it for. Part of your conversation with them when you're talking to them, if they have a price in mind, is asking them, how did you come up with that price? We'll talk about that a little bit later. But at least you'll know in the beginning of that conversation of what did they pay for the property. If they bought it five years ago, and now all of a sudden they want like $150,000 more than they paid for it, there hasn't been that much appreciation. This can only help your argument uh, that you're making for the price that you want to get the property at. Okay, so that's very important. Also, you want to know some basic information about the property. You want to know the beds and baths, okay, and make sure that you're checking in public record because if the homeowner says this is a four bedroom, three bath, you do want to point out to them at some point in time, whether you feel like it's the appropriate time on the call or if you get an opportunity or when you create the opportunity for yourself to go to the property, um, you want to know, you know, what it is legally. If it's a three bedroom, two bath, but they're saying it's a four bedroom, two bath, and then you find the garage is enclosed legally and there's no permits, then you'll know. Um, and if they, if you do have a discussion, but on your cold call and you're going to be following up with the seller afterwards and going to the house, you might as well do a permit history search so that you know right there. So that when that homeowner tries to tell you, no, 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 the roof was good. I think it was done in 2011. We just had a property that I was looking at this very morning and the, the roof was permitted in 1995. So it's a big difference from the homeowner telling us, oh, I bought it in 2011. I think it was done a couple years before I bought it. No, it was done like 15 years before you bought it almost. So, um, so you wanna know that information. And then also, is this a retail or rental property? Now, depending upon how they have the property situated now, you wanna ask them, you know, are you renting the property out or are they living in the property? Obviously, if the address of the owner is the same as the property, then more than likely they're living in it. But you can just always ask them anyways, are you living in the property? Are you renting the property out? And you should know when you make this call in your preliminary research, if the property is in a retail area or in a rental neighborhood. And we've talked about that in other um, Get You Moving Mondays. So you guys can always go to the library on YouTube and type in uh, knowing the difference if a property is rental or retail. I'm sure I've done at least a couple episodes on that. So um, that's also part of the preliminary information that you're gonna wanna know on the property, okay? When you make your, um, when you're starting to, to, before you make your cold calls. So get your preliminary research all together so you have your information right there in front of you. Now, there's a couple other things that we wanna do to get prepared uh, for this phone call. 
In our preliminary research and in the part of this, once we have all of the data collected of beds and baths and is it a rental property or a retail property, you want to know your ARV, okay? Find out what the ARV is from doing your comparable sales, okay? You want to know the comps that are in the area and then write these down or have these in front of you in Reifex because, you know, the seller, if they've lived in the property for 20 years, they know the area. They know the area better than you, especially the immediate area in the immediate neighborhood. So you can start telling them because most homeowners are going to tell you they think, you know, the property's worth this or that. Um, sometimes they'll tell you it's because, you know, this is what the Zestimate on Zillow is or this is just the price that they came up with because they're like, yeah, properties in this area are selling for $380,000. If you only find comps and the ARV is only 320, then you can educate them and let them know and understand, no, because these properties have sold. It's not a matter of opinion. The comps are the comps. The property have sold what the properties have sold. And you can give the homeowner the addresses and say, you can look these up, Google them on the you know, Broward County or Dade County or Palm Beach County property appraiser site and know they can see themselves what properties have sold because that's what's gonna determine the after repair value on their property, okay? And as you're talking to them, which we'll talk about in, in uh, a little bit later, is that you're gonna to wanna to be getting uh, some information about the condition of the property because um, you won't know what you're gonna be purchasing it for, but at least before you make the call, you should know what the ARV is. Okay. So the next thing that you want to do is you want to have your intro ready, okay? Your intro is mostly who you are and why you're calling them, okay? So for the who you are, make sure that you, uh, even if you need to write it down and script it for yourself. You know, I'm Ryan Kuhlman from KI Properties. We're purchasing properties in the neighborhood or um, you could go with the approach of saying, I'm Ryan Kuhlman, my family and I are looking for a couple properties to purchase in the area. Um, some friends of ours own a rental property in the area and they're going to help us manage it. Whatever the story is, however you're going to be doing those cold calls. If you're cold calling people that are facing a foreclosure, you could call them and say, hi, I'm Ryan. Uh, I'm from KI Properties. We are a family operation or a family company that helps homeowners first and foremost keep their properties and uh, avoid foreclosure and you can kind of start having the call you know the phone call start out that way so depending upon the types of properties that you're calling that day your intro might change a little bit but just in basic form it's the who you are and why you're calling them okay that's the first thing that you want to uh, make sure you're letting them know and you can even introduce and, and put uh, information what I usually put in my intro sometimes I make a little funny joke of like I promise I'm not a phone salesman or a telemarketer I hate those guys you know you want to throw in a little bit of that because then the homeowner would be like yeah I don't like telemarketers either and then you could even have a little conversation on telemarketers because remember at the end of the day cold calling is the same as door knocking um, you want to get a good rapport with them if you spend a half an hour on the phone and you only talk 10 minutes about real estate, but 20 minutes you talked about life or the neighborhood, or maybe you know you knew somebody, uh, uh, their kids went to high school and, and you went to that high school, whatever common ground that you can find with them, uh, that's a good phone conversation because we're trying to get their trust, we're trying to get them to like us, and we're trying to get a result at the end of this conversation, okay? So your intro is who you are and why. What you also want to include in your intro of course, we always want to be friendly, okay? I use the same concept when I go door knocking as I do with my cold calling. It might sound uh, foolish to you, but when I'm getting ready to make that call, I've already got a smile on my face because you can hear that through the phone. It's not as prevalent as when you're standing in front of somebody and you can actually look at their facial expressions, but be friendly, have that smile, be very upbeat, okay? Um, be very polite because sometimes you're going to have homeowners that aren't going to be very polite to you, so you don't want to fall into that trap. Don't be emotional. Don't get caught up in the emotion of it, because remember, it's not your property. You know, if, if you don't do business with that seller, you just go on to the next one, okay? So you want to kind of maintain that, but just make sure that you're polite, but you also want to try to stay in control. Your preliminary research that we talked about before you actually make their call, having the information and feeling confident that you're like, you know, sir or madam, 
This is what properties are selling for. Here's the last three properties that sold within a half a mile, six months back of your property. This is what these properties are gonna be selling for. You can give them the argument of that, no, I'm not gonna be able to purchase your property for this amount because I'd have to sell it for you know, $380,000. There's no houses that are comping at 380. You can give them the argument to say, I'm a, you know, we would be doing a rehab possibly on this project, on this property, and if we do a rehab, we're, we're gonna to need to make sure that the property, the price we have the property is going to appraise. Otherwise, I won't be able to sell it. And if there's no other comparable properties that have sold for that price, it's simply not going to appraise. People can say all day long, this is what I want for the property. And, and what we always say too is that truly, the real price on a property is what someone's willing to pay for it. Okay, great. If some idiot wants to pay $100,000 more than the rest of the comps in the neighborhood because he really wants to live in that house, that's fine. But the reality is, is that our after repair value, our market value on the house is by actual facts. It's here's the properties that are selling in your neighborhood. This is what they're selling for. I don't create the numbers. I don't create the math. It creates itself. Okay. So that's very important in your intro. What you also want to have in your intro is let the seller talk. You want to make sure that you're not doing all of the talking. Make sure that you're asking questions. And people love to talk about their properties. They love to talk about the neighborhood. Simple, basic questions that you can include in letting the seller talk, okay? You wanna let the seller continue to talk. So I'm gonna give you guys a couple of things that you can ask the seller, basic questions, um, to make sure that they are interacting in the conversation, okay? So questions that you can ask. How long have you lived in the property? Or how long have you lived in the area? You know, oh, how long have you lived in South Florida? Where are you originally from? And then they say, oh, I'm from New York. Well, maybe you're from New York. Oh, well, there you go. Now you found some common ground and now you can have a conversation about New York and moving down here, you know, these kind of things. All of these types of questions and the answers that they give you will give you opportunities to continue conversation with them, okay? So you can always say, you know, how long have you lived in the property? And then also, the condition of the property. You could always ask them, you know, if you don't mind, I'd just like to ask you a few questions about the condition of the property. You know, um, how old is the roof? Have you ever had to replace the AC system? You know, and again, if they say something like, yeah, you know, the AC system, we had to replace it two years ago, you could throw in something and say, yeah, you know, I had to replace my AC system or some reference or something that you have of that. Again, it's always trying to find some type of common ground. So how long have you lived in the property? Uh, the condition or even lived in the area you can ask that question as well too um, the condition of it uh, if they have kids or if you hear a dog barking in the background ask them about their kids ask them about their dog okay then a very important question to get them talking probably the most important question why are you selling the property that's how we start to get to their motivation remember every good deal, the common element is having a motivated seller. So we want to ask them, why are you selling the property? That's probably the number one um, question, but to, to you know, make the conversation go on a little longer, having the condition, how long have you lived here? And of course the answer is to to listen, why are you selling? Oh, we're relocating to you know, North Dakota. I mean, start talking a little bit about North Dakota. If I'm sitting at the computer, I might Google North Dakota and I might see something about North Dakota. I might ask about it. Oh, have you ever been, you know, here or there? You know, you never know. I mean, you just want to try to come up with those types of conversations to get that rapport with the homeowner. Okay. So um, that is your intro. Okay. So the last part is getting a result from the phone call. So now you're ready to make the call. Okay. Okay. So the first thing is, is when you're trying to get a result um, is asking the, the, the question, not only why they're selling, but do they have a price in mind? Okay. If they have a price in mind, you can ask them some questions like, you know, where did you come up with that price? How did you determine that, that that's what, you know, the property is? They might start telling you and talk about their motivation. Well, we need this price because I need to have $40,000 because I'm putting it down on another property that I'm buying or something like this. Okay. Or especially if they tell you something like, I have to come up with it because I owe the IRS taxes, you know, which they may not tell you, but, uh, but that's going to be, you know, some more obvious ones. But so getting a result, you want to ask them the price. If they're going to ask you to give them a price over the phone, first try to, to ask if you can have at least, you know, 30 minutes or an hour's worth of time to sort of look at the numbers. Sometimes you will have for sale by owners that will tell you, no, 
I don't want you to come buy the property, just give me a price, you're a professional investor, which I give them the argument of saying to them, you know, sir, madam, when you buy a car, don't you go and test drive it, you sit in it, you get the feel of it, you see the condition of it. Sometimes you know you have a mechanic come and check it. It's the same way that a professional investor will buy a property. There are people out there that will give you a number over the phone, but most of them, nine out of 10, they're not real investors because they're not professional enough to come to the property, take pictures, and actually have a contractor like I have to be able to go over the information and really determine what's the best fair market value I can give you for the house. So if they still demand that they want an offer of the phone, I first tell them that it, ne it might necessarily not be my highest offer. Okay, so that's the first thing that I tell them. But try to get them to give you some time, you know, to, to, you know, to, to call them back so you can kind of crunch the data as far as the condition of the property, get your numbers. If again, they're being more difficult and they're saying, no, just give me a price of what you pay for the property. I just want to see if it's going to be a waste of our time. Then according to the ARV, throw out a number to them, okay? Um, if, you, if you talk to them about the condition of the property, um, you can go ahead as a general rule and say, okay, that's gonna be you know, $50,000 to fix up the property. I need about $100,000 spread or a little bit more in between the price of, of the ARV and what I need to purchase it at. Um, so you can just use that as a, as a quick rule to say, okay, it's gonna be you know, $150,000 or between somewhere around there from the ARV. So I start at 150 from the ARV and then I can work my way up. In general, if a property does need um, a decent amount of, of rehab, nothing, you know, nothing crazy, um, if there's only $100,000 spread in between the two, there's not enough room. Just in general rules of rehabs, if there's only $100,000 difference between the ARV and my purchase price, by the time I do uh, the, the rehab, by the time I do the holding costs, the closing, sell the property, everything, you'll see. Do the numbers, run the numbers on your rehab projects um, or potential rehab projects and you'll see that the numbers don't work out. So, so getting a result, I want to get a price from them, um, but more importantly, the result you really want is you want to go to the property. You want to have an opportunity to make an appointment with them to come and see the property yourself, okay? Especially if you've had a good conversation with them, you know, to let them know, listen, I want to give you the best fair market value that I can, the best price that I can for your property. Because a lot of times, you know, they're not going to tell you what the price is. They want you to come up with a price because if they throw out a price and it's too low and you say yes, then they're going to be thinking to themselves, should have asked more. It's the same thing that I would say. So you want to make a, uh, an appointment to actually go to the property, okay? That's a definite result. Now, um, if they don't allow you to go to the property, or let's say you put a price out over the phone, then obviously you have to think about the next step. Stay in contact with them, that you're gonna follow up with them, okay? The follow-up is most important. And it doesn't matter that somebody has told you on the phone, oh no, that price is never gonna work for me. You know, I have to get this you know, amount for the property. You never know what things are gonna change, okay? And just because somebody tells you, absolutely not, I'm not taking less than $225,000 for my property, there's been many times that that seller, a week or two later, would be like, okay, how about 205? Once they start lowering their price, you know that you could probably get a few more price reductions from them, okay? So you wanna stay in contact. So either getting the result is either getting the price out of them and having that discussion on the phone to really see how motivated they are if they tell you, they want $100,000 more than what the ARV in the neighborhood is. They're not really interested in selling right now. They're just throwing it out just to see what you know, kind of offers they're gonna get. Um, then they're not really motivated. Then you can just you know, use that um, to, to follow up with them at some point in time, but just know they're probably just not gonna be motivated, okay? The reason why you wanna stay in contact and follow up with them is because you know, maybe there will be something that will happen that they will become more motivated. Um, but the real result that you want is you want to be able to go to the property, make an appointment, and, and here's a few things that you can think about um, in order to make the appointment, to, because that's really the result that you want. The result you, that you want from the, from the cold call is to introduce yourself and then to be able to get an appointment, okay? So when you, when you are, are working on that and, and talking to the homeowner about the appointment, you know, maybe even throwing out to them, hey, listen, how about I just come to the property, I'll take pictures of it, I'll give you a fair market analysis. I'll print out all this information I'm talking about of the properties that have sold in the neighborhood and everything so that you have all the information you need and then you decide what option is best for you. You make the decision of what you wanna do, okay? That sounds, rel sounds relatively painless, 
right? It's not like going to the dentist and getting drilled for cavities. You're just gonna have somebody come over to your property for free, take pictures of the property, take you five minutes to walk in and out of that property, by the way. It's not gonna take up an entire afternoon and they're gonna get a free estimate on their property as far as what the property value is and what it's worth, okay? So that's really the result that you're looking for that you wanna get out of the end of your cold call. Now, one of the last things is, is that when you're gonna be doing your follow-up um, on the property with the price, let's say you threw out a price 200 and they say, no, that's just not gonna work for me, that's too low. You could always use the excuse to say, well, let me talk to you know, my, my uh, partner and see you know, what, what he's thinking. Maybe he's got a different idea with the property. You can play good cop, bad cop. Um, and even if you don't have a business partner or if you have a family member or something that you're maybe working with or something, even though you both agree on the price that you want uh, the property at, you can always make that excuse to say, well, let me see, let me talk to my business partner, let me talk to my family and see if maybe we could offer a little bit more, you know, that kind of thing. Um, since you have the rapport with the homeowner, you want to be the good cop, obviously, and make the other person, whoever they are, the bad cop. Um, and then when you come back to them and you could say, okay, you know, I actually, you know, um, uh, has, uh, you know, we, we offered $200,000, but now I think that, you know, my, my partner and I have looked at it and, and you know, um, my business partner said that uh, he thinks we could offer, you know, 210, you know, would 210 work for you? Or you could always go back to the excuse to say, you know what, I also have some very large hedge fund buyers that usually overpay for properties. And this is a good um, argument to give them in the very beginning, or at least just part of of you know, ending the conversation with anyone or anytime you're talking to a seller is to always let them know to say, hey, look, um, sometimes you know, if I give you this, this you know, uh, um, price for your property, okay, if it's a really high price, you can always say, well, I have to probably get a little bit creative with this. I might have to partner with another investor or I have some very large buyers that maybe they'll just take the property off my hands. So I'm still getting you the result that you want and, um, and you know, they'll, they'll throw me a referral fee or something like that for finding the property. I just want to let you know that we have multiple options um, and scenarios that we look at. Uh, we, you know, we, we think outside the box a little bit because obviously I want to try to make this a win-win situation for us both, okay? So those are some of the other things that you can think about um, within your conversation with these homeowners to try to get them, you know, to that, to that, next, uh, to that next step, which is the renegotiation and, and continuing to follow up with them. Okay, so this was part two of the three-part series. Next week, we're going to be releasing part three. So stay tuned for that because we're going to be talking a little bit more about when you go out to assess the property, a little bit more about your cold call conversation turning into a face-to-face -face and the follow-up as well. So we'll be discussing that in a little bit more detail next week. And now you know what time it is. Uh, announcements. Okay, so next week, of course, it's the 1st of June. The 1st of the month means only one thing other than payday to some people and rent that's due uh, to some others. But the 1st of the month for us, for the Broward and Miami-Dade Real Estate Investor Association means it's our meeting. So the first Tuesday of the month is the Miami-Dade meetings. The first Wednesday of the month is the Broward meeting. We're gonna be having Joe Varnador of Note School. Joe has been here probably four times over the last five or six years, and it's always backed by popular demand. People are always asking them to come back. Note School is perhaps the most respected and successful note buying school in the entire country. People love these guys. So Joe's coming back. June the 5th is going to be the Miami uh, meeting at the Miami Pullman Hotel. Doors open at 6 o'clock. We're going to have our networking as always and our tabletop expo. And then we'll be going into the main room where Joe's going to be teaching for about an hour and a half on buying notes, performing and non-performing notes. And then we'll be doing that meeting again the next day um, on Wednesday, June the 6th. And that's going to be at the Signature Grand. Doors open at 5.30. We have our networking from 5.30 to 7. And then again, we'll go into the main room where Joe's going to teach you again about buying performing and non-performing notes. And this is not, not something that you can just do in South Florida. Buying notes is something you can do all over the country. So don't miss either one of those meetings. All right, boys and girls. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's episode. Thanks for joining me on another Get You Moving Monday today. I hope I got you guys moving. Now remember, you can always go to our websites to upcoming events and you can look at and register for upcoming events way ahead of time. A lot of the seminars and special seminars and things that we have sell out quickly. So we're always telling people go to the website early and a lot of times we have pre-registration prices for things like our boot camp uh, as well. 
Um, go to our YouTube channel, the Broward Real Estate Investors Association. Uh, please subscribe to that. We're always releasing content on our YouTube channel. And of course, we have our Facebook pages for the Miami-Dade Real Estate Investors Association and the Broward Real Estate Investors Association as well. Give us a like. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you guys at one of the next meetings. And as I always say, between now and that time, remember, every day is a new opportunity for your success.